I guess I, the question I want to ask is like, I think this is often a, a, a term that I have struggled or a word that I have a struggle with. I struggle with. I've talked about it over the years in, in regards to subjects like this, which is hope, which is the sense that hope is a human thing. We need it. We, you know, every day we anticipate the good that's going to come and we need that. Otherwise, you know, what is the point of living? Um, regarding massive crises like the climate crisis or the ecological crisis at large, having some sense of hope can give us the motivation to do today. You know, there's all of these spins and sort of takes on that subject, but I've come to understand hope as being a limiting kind of way of understanding the world, which is the sense that somebody somewhere is going to fix it, or there is some, some inevitable sense of like, there's a curve, like a, a, what is the, what is the word? Um, there's a, uh, that the universe curves towards justice or something like that sense yeah. that optimism, that things are just inevitably moving in that direction. So I'm curious how you grapple with this, because I think when looking at climate data, there are aspects of that that seem or are irreversible. And that means certain things are going to happen and you can kind of extrapolate from there. So how do you deal with this question of like, do you have any hope or what is hope? So there was a study in Harvard um, about hope. Um, I think it's 2016, somewhere in that uh, period of time, um, where they found that those people who had hope actually were less motivated to be activists. Hmm. And it's for exactly the reason that you said, when you have hope, what that implies is that you th believe the problem has a solution. Hmm. And once you believe that, then you, just because we're not all experts in everything, once you think a problem has a solution, you assume that there are people implementing that solution, that that's what they're doing, right? So that makes you less motivated to act. And um, my view of hope comes from um, Pandora's box, which, um, you know, when she opened the box, letting out all the evils into the world, there was one evil that remained uh, in the box when she shut it, or mm -hmm. there was one thing left in the box, mm -hmm. right? And that one thing left in the box was hope. At least that's the modern um, interpretation of it. Mm. So what it actually meant in the original uh, language was deceptive expectations. So hope equals deceptive expectations. When someone tells you to have hope, what they're saying is that you can expect that this thing can happen or that a future can be a certain way. Mm. When the person saying that has the knowledge that that's not possible, right? Deceptive expectations, you know, buy this car, it'll help you, um, you know, have a, a better sex life, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Whatever. You, you, we sell deceptive, uh, deceptive expectations are what sells products. Hope sells products, right? It is a mechanism of capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, hope. So I view hope as, a, as an evil. I view it as something that constrains us from action, that limits us, that is used to keep us blind and keep us deceived about things. Um, and so I am, um, you know, there is this idea of this thing called hopium, right? That there is this drug of hope, um, this feeling that people are numbed by hope. And um, you know, Michael Mann uses a different word. His word is agency, that we all have the power as individuals to make choices. Um, well, while we all do ha have that power, that presumes that the choice we should all make is the one he wants us to make, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> that, that there is some universal consensus on what agency means um, in order to solve the world's problems. Or as a uh, doctor, uh, I think you say her name is Gilbs, G-I-L-B-Z. She's an Antarctic uh, climate researcher who just recently posted a YouTube about um, what's happening, the, the rapid loss of ice on, uh, in Antarctica. And her word was courage, right? Courage as opposed to hope. Mm -hmm. So what does courage mean? It means um, the ability to go against what um, you consider safe, right? To do something that you would think unsafe um, because you believe that uh, a higher good for the planet 
would result from that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that in some sense is the right word. Um, and so uh, it takes some courage to be a doomer, you know, <laughs> to realize that the best thing we could do is not have green energy, not have windmills, not have solar, not have nuclear. The best thing we could do is to not have more oil. The best thing we could do is to have civilization collapse just as quickly as it possibly can so that, um, you know, in a controlled way if possible, so we don't lose all the nuclear plants, so that as much of this planet can be preserved as possible for whatever comes after us. You know, right. so so when she speaks of courage, that is not the sense in which she is using the word. She's mm. using the word courage as, you know, have the um, the courage to stand up for um, what needs to be done politically or socially mm. to make these changes happen to preserve um, as much of Antarctic as we can. Mm. So I do agree with the word courage um, as mm. a meaningful word in this um, sort of rhetorical vocabulary that she used, but both hope and agency are, are um, at, at best used to um, keep us numb and deceived. Yeah. Yeah, I think that to me, I associate that it's it's like hope is there is a yeah there is a sense that there we're treating this as a problem and not a predicament, and that we're treating these things as sets of problems that can be fixed, and that if certain steps were taken, that we can alleviate or and maybe some of it could be. I'm not saying it can't be alleviated, but to say that there is a solution is sort of I think naive, and um, yeah. and I also think that. Um, the solutions that are being presented to us are based on the same logic that produced the problem to begin with right. or the predicament to begin with. Like, what does it mean to move to wind and solar or nuclear or any other alternative energy? Um, is that even possible? And how much of that is based on hope rather than what's actually feasible and realistic? How do you move a civilization built almost completely infrastructurally on fossil fuels to another energy system that is still also relying on maybe a, another form of fossil fuel production another or ener another energy source. And, you know, you mentioned yeah. um, I, uh, the difference between a problem and a predicament, and I'm not mm. sure how sophisticated your audience is, but problems mm. have solutions. Predicaments don't. Yeah. And we're mm. in a predicament, right? Mm -hmm. So the predicament has many problems associated with it. Um, most of which have solutions, but mm -hmm. the problems are not the same as the predicament. And the predicament we're in is overshoot, right? We are yeah. in a situation with um, more humans than the carrying capacity of the planet. And as a result, we're having to destroy everything about the planet to try and maintain uh, this level of, of consumption. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's I, I heard you... Um, using themes there that I recognize from, you know, other people who talk about this, and I don't know uh, exactly, you know, who your audience is, but uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate you you bringing that up. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what my audience is all the time either, but I do get the sense from people who do contact me or you know leave send me messages that I am through this work addressing a predicament and that. The predicament is not one that requires that, that I think what people find distressing in their personal lives right now is that there isn't a seemingly a, a way to to know how to process this information in a way that feels community oriented and that it's often happening on an individual level. Um, people feel kind of alienated and alone by a lot of this because you know, how do you bring this up in polite conversation? I've tried, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's fun because it's interesting to see if you detach yourself a little bit and don't have any expectations going into those conversations of what people's reactions will be. But ultimately, yeah, you know, most people, I think, are comforted on some level by the normalcy that we have, but that normalcy is predicated on some extraordinary levels of exploitation and violence with out really uh, without any real long-term thinking involved. Um, and so I think people that are thinking through these things 
I think there's a process and I don't think it's a, there's no end point to it. I don't think it's like you decide you're a doomer or a post doom or whatever. And all of a sudden you're no longer grieving. You're no longer feeling even despair or any of these things or not even feeling surprised. I think that there can be comfort in, in knowing there can be a, a perceived sense of comfort in having this label attached to yourself and identifying yourself a certain way. But that is, I think, a false comfort because it doesn't matter who or what you call yourself. Confronting the horrors of <laughs> the 21st century is, um, I don't know if anybody can really like fully anticipate or comprehend what's coming or what's happening right now. So, yeah, yeah um, it, it's true. And, and the emotion that I, because you mentioned grief um mm -hmm. is is uh sadness so the grieving process you know has these different elements to it depression you know and and um is one of them but depression is more of a clinical situation where you know you don't want to get out of bed in the morning you don't want to mm -hmm. uh, eat or you eat too much and you know it has these sort of classical symptoms to it but sadness is something that um I talk about a lot. I mean, mm. how profoundly sad I am. And mm. I mean, I'm sad for the planet. I'm sad for all the suffering that goes on. I'm also sad for the loss of human legacy, you know, as somebody who looks at medicine and physics and the arts, you know, as this triad of the most remarkable achievements of, of humanity. I'm sad to know that that legacy is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I feel like that should be immortal. The fact that we have the James Webb telescope and can peer back to the beginning of the universe, right? There's a certain immortality that you want associated with the fact that our species has attained that, um, or at the very least to, to let that knowledge carry on through some natural lifespan of, of humans that would be, you know, commensurate with a different animal, but to know that that's going away you know, in the in the short term, in this century, mm -hmm. in the next decades ahead of us, um, you know, I'm not a, a lot of people when I ask these sort of poll questions on my Twitter account, a lot of people don't look at, at uh, tw the year 2030 with optimism. You yeah. know, they, mm -hmm. they look at that as a very long way off and that a lot of stuff is going to go wrong before then. And, and then beyond that, looking forward to 2040 or 2050, it just becomes a blur uh, mm -hmm. uh, how can humanity possibly exist to those years? Um, and you know, that's, that's really sad. I mean, it's really sad that, that people your age look, are staring that right in the face or just, you know, are seeing the year 2050 or, or, you know, there's, we are going to have this huge, uh, sea level rise. It's a slow process, mm -hmm. right? We are going to see that. And, when that happens, there's, you know, there, the major port cities of the planet will cease to exist. And yeah. when those cease to exist, uh, you know, Hong Kong and, and Seattle and other, you know, Florida, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we won't be able to ship goods around the planet. And, yeah. you know, if the Panama Canal dries up. So this is, yeah. um, there are sort of absolute truths about the near term term future and the the one of the absolute truths is that civilization will collapse and mm. that millions or billions of people will die because of it and um they will die not just because of heat but they'll die because the planet to feed 8 billion or however many people we get to um requires this really um perfect sort of architecture of transporting goods and services from one place to the other that will become impossible, mm -hmm. you know, as, as infrastructure gets destroyed. Right. Um, so we're looking in this century at some very hard times for the human civilization and for the planet. And it's inevitable. Um, it's 100% going to happen. So all I can do is wish that it happens as quickly and painlessly as possible, <laughs> you know, a planet on hospice, you yeah. know, we, we want to um, make the process as painless for the planet for whatever, you know, to get as much as possible to survive us, 
and to survive this horrible, monstrous thing we've created, um, you know, th this world eating machine we've created. Right. So, you know, that's the emotion I have um, and sort of the perspective I have on the near term future is, is just this profound sadness. Um, so, you know, being a doomer doesn't mean that you're somehow not sad, <laughs> you know, but, no. but uh, depressed, no. Um, grieving in a classical sense, no. But, uh, you know, with sadness, you can take action. You can be an activist, right? Mm -hmm. Sadness doesn't preclude um, acts of generosity or kindness or service, right? You right. can still do those things. You're not going to be locked at home waiting for the world to end. 